Hey, so today we have the pleasure of having Kevin O'Connor with us. As most of you know, Kevin is founder of Giant Double Click, the company that developed into what we know today as Google Ads Pay That Network. His company was the largest company that Google acquired in its history for over $3 billion. And Kevin is also founder at Graphic, which was acquired by Amazon and was also founding investor at ISS, a company that was acquired by IBM for more than $1 billion. I remember when we, when we founded the agency Balloon Group almost nine years ago, and every agency was trying to, to get certified by DoubleClick. They were the best. And Kevin is today one of our main investors and sits at Core's board of directors. So it's a total privilege to have in your team one of the people you admire the most. So thank you, Kev, for trusting in us. Effort pays, pays back in, in the long term. So, but this is not a board meeting, right? So let's welcome to Kevin to this episode. Uh, my name is Santi Viloni, and today we're going to hear about breakthroughs, about opportunities, and also some guidance on how to overpass this global crisis. So first, thank you, Kev, for being with us. Welcome. Thanks for that kind of introdu introduction, Santi. <laughs> Great to be here. Thank you. Honored, and, and uh, it's a pleasure. So, Kev. Your company revolutionized how advertising looked like at that time. It really transformed how people made business out of internet. Can you tell us a little bit more what made DoubleClick so successful? Yeah, that's definitely ancient history. You know, it was over 25 wow. years ago. Um, <laughs> the UPS man that, that just showed up. Hang on one second. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Everyone knows that in, in these coronavirus moments, yeah. we are all at home. Yeah, we, I, I, I took care of all the noise, except I didn't, didn't expect the UPS guy. Um, <laughs> but definitely ancient history. I mean, you know, back then, we weren't even sure the internet was going to be anything popular. And, and, and uh, once we got T1, 1.4 megabit, I think, we were, we were really impressed. And uh, we were trying to figure out like how were people, you know, what was going to be the economy of the internet? You know, you're going to sell things, subscriptions, advertising, and and we got settled on advertising since most media's mediums are uh, dominated by advertising dollars. Uh, There's just one big problem: we we didn't know anything about advertising, so we ran out <laughs> and got two books. Uh, one was uh, Nash's Direct Marketing, um, and the other one was uh, uh, the definitive textbook on on advertising. And I was reading through it. I'm like, yeah, we can do that. We can do reach. Uh, we can do frequency. We can do targeting. We can do <laughs> kind of do the kind of the kind of all the all the things that that advertisers dreamed about doing. Uh, we can actually we we felt like we could do it. Uh, but the real challenge on the internet, of course, was there was no dollars flowing. There was no money. Um, so we tried to create this. Um, our whole model was to create this this optimization network where we could. Uh, using data that we collected from users and websites that we were, we'd be able to optimize, get, get publishers the most amount of dollars, but also uh, give the most effective advertising spend uh, to, to advertisers. And for the users, we'd give them free internet, uh, give them access to the world's information. So that was kind of the basic, crazy. basic premise. But kind of one of our, we had two big breakthroughs at the time. One was, of course, doing all the advertising stuff. Um, but at the time, uh, airlines were losing a lot of money. And the guy at, at American Airlines came up with this whole concept of, of uh, airline seats of perishable goods. So you're going to be able to sell things at flexible pricing. And our whole model was based on, on, on that, uh, which was there would be no unsold advertising. Every ad, every time a person went to a website and there was a blank, blank ad, that was a lost opportunity. So we wanted to create something where there was all advertising was spent. And then the other one was we, you know, we, we basically were a, a giant accounting machine. We were accounting microtransactions to make sure that publishers got paid and advertisers uh, were delivered what they were promised, which was kind of lacking back then. Um, but it was, you know, it was, it was an automated marketplace. And today it's such a sophisticated, uh, uh, impressive system. It's kind of a combination of NASDAQ and eBay and, 
and and data science, artificial intelligence. I mean, it's just it's a it's a it's, it's an incredible system. <laughs> you said that you you did know nothing about advertising today. You probably you're one of the people that knows the most, and you know you know a lot about you know a lot about advertising today and all about uh, a lot about technology and internet. How do you think, Kev, that technology will impact advertisers and, and agencies these days? There's, there's probably, probably three things to talk about. One is just data in general. Uh, you know, data, there's, there's, everyone talks about, you know, big data and collecting data and everything else. There's, there's no shortage of data. It's really trying to figure out uh, getting the signal through the noise. Um, and be able to, you know, folks like Facebook, Google, uh, Amazon, they're going to dominate because they got some of the most valuable data. They have, of course, intent. Uh, Amazon has purchase. So looking for those signals, uh, really, really strong signals through, through the noise is, is, is the key thing. Um, at at DoubleClick, probably our, our greatest innovation, uh, we discovered this hugely predictive signal, which was retargeting. Uh, we never made any money off it for all sorts of <laughs> um, crash and privacy, but that was a really important signal. Uh, the fact that someone had come to your website um, uh, and, and be able to capture that. So being able to capture things like um, interest and intent, uh, being able to model, uh, looking for most valuable, you know, taking, taking your known customer base uh, and be able to model that and to find lookalikes. And of course, you know, the Facebooks and, and, and Googles are going to have that information. Um, but I think you're going to see, you know, people coming together and forming data pools to capture some of this intent. Uh, we, we had bought a company called Abacus Direct at, at, at uh, DoubleClick and it was, it was an amazing company. And, and just real briefly, what they did is they aggregated all information for the catalog industry and then sold it back to them. So, People tend to be very obsessed about their, their data. They think their data is a, is a key asset. And in reality, it's not. Um, what, what, what is really an important asset is, is forming uh, or joining some type of consortium where you can uh, uh, share the intent data that you have along with your competitors uh, or other people that are outside your, your market. So I think that's going to be really, uh, really, really important. Now, there's all sorts of privacy issues and everything else, but, but I, think, I think it can be done properly. Uh, but this data is going to be really important, I think, for for sort of the next aspect, which is which is you know the you talk about the customer journey, you know, from from finding people that you know fit your profile uh, and taking them through all the way through purchase. You know, this data is going to drive that, not just from the advertising side, uh, but from you know when they come to your website. And it's not just advertising on the on the web; uh, it's it's advertising uh, offline as well. Uh, there's an interesting company that we had, we had spoken to where they're actually doing retargeting offline. Uh, so if you're looking for a, a large considered purchase, let's say a, 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 um, uh, let's say a mattress, uh, you come to the website, you didn't buy, and they would send you a postcard. Um, so that was a, you know, it's a very effective, effective way of reaching your, your, um, nice. uh, your, your prospect. Um, and so it, none of this would be, be done by humans. I mean, you'll set up a basic framework uh, but everything from uh, this is where I think where artificial intelligence, machine learning uh, will will play an important aspect. And, and by the way, by by keeping everything siloed, you, you never learn enough about the data, the the, the prospect, the customer. Uh, whereas when you pull all this information together, you find out, you know, if they're in, if they uh, if they're interested in a car, um, uh, they're going to be interested in you know car accessories. So being able to pull all this information together. Uh, and, and, and use it, you know, from both the advertising side and, and as well as on the, you know, um, getting them to the website and closing is going to be really, really important. And sort of the third one is, is uh, uh, let me step back. I, I have this, came up with this basic theorem, I don't know, back in the early 2000s that every industry really becomes a tech company. Uh, not that every industry uh, becomes a software development company. Uh, and in fact, I think it's quite the opposite. I think that that one of the biggest mistakes that, that people make is, is they, uh, they try to develop, they, take, they try to develop their own software and use that as a competitive advantage. And uh, it, it just doesn't work. Um, and I'll get into that a little bit more, but the concept that, that every industry becomes a tech company and you're seeing this with FinTech and InsureTech, 
uh, construct tech. Uh, back in 2004, I came across a company, uh, ironically called Procore, uh, which is not to be confused with Core, uh, but it, ironically, it's also how I met Sandy. Uh, but they were trying to uh, uh, automate the construction industry, uh, which was a very large industry, but didn't use technology. Uh, and, and so they did project management. They, they do it today. They're the largest company today. Uh, but how, how people use technology to, to basically uh, remove the friction within the, within the, uh, the company uh, to be able to you know, allocate resources uh, more efficiently. And ironically, agencies and construction companies are, are, are fairly similar in the sense that they, they operate on, on very thin margins. A lot of money flows through them, but they actually operate on thin margins. And being able to utilize uh, resources uh, is essential. Um, that's probably one of the biggest areas where, where, where people uh, lose money is, is um, a bad utilization of resources. Uh, the, being able to accurately forecast you know, what job should cost, how much time it's gonna take, um, you know, that's another area uh, where, where construction companies and agencies struggle with and just increasing productivity. Um, you, you know, back, it took Procore a long time to be successful, uh, primarily because construction companies had so much business. Uh, it was really the last recession where construction companies had to, had to become uh, more efficient uh, that they started to really embrace technology. Um, and sort of one of my... Um, one of my pieces of advice for companies struggling to, to get through this time, this is really the time where you focus on efficiencies uh, and how do you use technology to increase uh, efficiency. So not only so you can reduce expenses today, but when you come out of this um, and you will come out, um, you'll be at a much better competitive advantage. Uh, one of the, I think, mistakes that people make uh, is they, you know, software, I've been doing software for 35 years. Uh, it's hard. Uh, it's really, really hard. Um, it's hard to do it when when you're a software company, hard enough. Uh, but it's it's virtually impossible to do when you, when you're not a, a software company. Uh, and so we saw this. We saw this with with DoubleClick. Uh, your publishers built their own advertising system. Uh, there was probably a hundred different advertising systems out there. And there's there's three advertising systems today. Um, you know, it's not their core competency. They really don't, they don't have economy of scale for, for R and D. Um, you know, if you look at all the most successful tech companies, it's the ones that are able to amortize their R and D expense across the largest customer base. Uh, it's really that simple. Uh, and, and you can't do it if you're, you're an agency, you may even be the biggest agency in the world. You cannot possibly um, uh, 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 amortize your R and D expense just across your own organization. And they're really the last one is data. Um, you, you know, the SaaS companies are able to collect really insightful data and be able to expose that data, not to you know, protect the privacy and protect you know, your, your, your crisis, but to share that data um, to, to show how are you performing, how, you, how can you improve, uh, and that's really essential. Nice, yeah, I agree. Um, probably most of the people here that are listening knows, know very well that agencies, also construction, but probably here, a lot of advertisers, a lot of advertisers, a lot of agencies you know that uh, are like thin margin businesses. So yeah, utilization, resources, um, accurate forecasting, increasing productivity. So that's probably one of the one of the reasons you you join us at Core, right? <laughs> so, Kev, what what do you what do you see as as the next big technology or, or technologies, plural, right? Or trends? So that's a very broad, broad subject. Um, and it's always tough, it's always tough to, to be able to, to figure out like what's a fad and what's a trend. Uh, there's lots of technologies that, that people, I, I get, I probably get a, uh, a business plan every other week about blockchain technologies. Um, you know, not a big believer in it. I just, it's a, it's a technology searching for a solution. Now, that solution was, was of course digital currency, which is in my mind a scam. So, so, so there's really no, no purpose for it. Um, but trying to figure out like what's a fad and what's a trend. Um, so the ones I think they're gonna be very important. Uh, I think marketplaces, you know, just the marketplaces, they've been very successful on the consumer side. 
I think they've become uh, increasingly big on the on the B2B side. Uh, I'm an investor in a company called Snapwire that that takes you know basically outsources the the whole photography photo shoot um, to to uh, thousands of photographers you know all around the world. Um, and I think you're going to see that you know across many and you already see it uh, to some extent. Yeah. Um, it's been extremely popular and, and, you know, for sort of the low wage, you know, up, you know, up work, um, it's been very successful, you know, when you got to do uh, very some menial work for three bucks an hour, but, you know, it's going to become increasingly, increasingly big on the, on the professional level, uh, especially yeah. with, you know, COVID. I, I, I think, I think one of the out, outshoots of this, um, you know, you hear companies talk about remote, we're remote first, and I was a little bit leery of that. But the reality is that you know we the whole world went to remote overnight, and yeah, and yeah the economy's taking a hit, but 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 we're actually doing really really well, and I think that people are going to build, um, and I believe Core is building uh, uh, things into their into their product right now uh, to make more uh, remote more um, uh, seamless, um, AI and and machine learning. Uh, you know, I, I, every business plan has, has AI and machine learning in it. Um, it is a technology that does not solve all problems um, um, by any means, but it solves, it can solve a lot of problems. It solves, general AI is, I won't be alive for general AI, AI to come out, but, but for very specific yeah. problems um, where you have good data, uh, with good outcome data and you can train the system, uh, it's going to be, it's going to be very good. Um, yeah. Part of what we did a graphic, ironically, graphic was, I'm obsessed with data. Uh, <laughs> graphic had to do, I won't get into too much about graphic, but we, we, we amassed a lot of data to do comparison engines, which was great for advertising. I, I, I talk about a great signal, people looking to buy something, but when it actually Amazon and, and Google and, and, and other folks were interested in what we were doing because we we're amassing data, which could then be used to answer questions for intelligent assistants. Um, so I've gotten to know the intelligent assistant in the bot world uh, fairly well. Uh, it's impressive. Uh, it's an impressive what people are doing. Uh, I think bots are getting a lot better for engaging prospects, taking them through the customer journey. Um, an investor company that is, does customer service able to peel off sort of 20% of customer service. Um, so I think that's what you got to look at sort of intelligent assistance bots where they can, they can sort of, sort of take that bottom 10, 20, 30% that is the same stuff over and over again um, uh, and, and, and make people more productive. Yeah, totally. So you said, you mentioned B2B marketplaces, AI and machine learning, intelligent assistance and bots. And if I will ask you, so you said, okay, these are probably next big technologies or trends or breakthroughs. What about those fats, these guys as, as trends? I, I guess the, the way that I always take a look at sort of, how do you tell those between a fat and a trend is, is, is it going to make something 10 times better or, or you know, one tenth the price? Is it is it so? And and how scalable in, is it? Um, and, and the agency advertisers tend to get. Well, I don't want to insult anyone, but and 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 this is natural. I mean, you, look, you're looking for something unique. Something you know, people are very very creative. Uh, I know a lot about, by the way, the the sort of nuts and bolts technology of advertising. I'm the least creative person um, you, you, you'll ever meet. Uh, I'm innovative, not creative. Uh, the fir first name, by the way, for DoubleClick was Internet Advertising Federation. It just kind of demonstrates. <laughs> um, but you know, for example, influencer networks became um, became very popular, um, and I saw some very cool technology in it. The problem with it is it's not hugely scalable. Uh, the quality assurance is really really bad, and and it's legal issues and, and, and the fact that, you know, how do you control your brand messaging? Uh, it just, you know, I, I just don't see it working. Um, uh, I talked about blockchain. Uh, yeah. People always forget about, you know, people talk about digital currency um, no. and blockchain. I don't think it's, I think those are fads or scams. Um, 
you know, I always remind people we have digital money. It's called Visa and Amex. I mean, we, you know, 97% of all, all, all money in this country is, is, is digital already. So um, what exactly are we, are we trying to solve? Um, and then the AI- machine. That's a big statement. <laughs> What's that? That's a big statement, I mean. Yeah, I mean, look, if you, you want, I, could, I could talk to you why I think it's a, <laughs> a scam. And I'm a libertarian, so I, I, I love that. I sort of love the concept, but, but digital currency is neither a, a currency, because uh, currencies are whole value, they shouldn't go up and down. Um, oh. And assets should be able to produce income, so it's not an asset, it's just, it's a, it's a giant P2P Ponzi scheme. Um, you think I should start selling mine or? <laughs> I mean, I would, I would sell. <laughs> but you know, I, someone asked me 10 years ago about it um, and, and I, I told him Bitcoin was a scam and he didn't buy it and you know, he would have been worth probably 10, 20 million dollars. So yeah, <laughs> I get them, you know, I, I, I get, I think I get stuff maybe 51% right. So <laughs> I thought I thought Twilio. I was I was offered. I, I knew Jeff Larson uh, extremely well uh, I, for years. I did, did a business with two businesses with with, with Jeff, and uh, I was like, "What? Why would anyone want to use the you know the phone? You know, Jeff, it's it's all about the internet, you know." And and so I totally missed that one. So it's it's so hard to to figure out um, fad and trend. And then like the last one I just, I think I mentioned was AI machine learning, even though it's sort of fits in both places. I think, I think people tend to, um, they, they try to- Like if it will solve it. everything, right? It just doesn't, you know, it's not magic. Yeah. Um, people think it's magic. I, I have a lot of experience in, the, in that area, just seeing what problems it can and can't solve. Um, it's just not there. I, I do think some of the stuff, by the way, uh, um, uh, which could play in the, in the, in the advertising role, uh, some of the stuff that's being done on, on you know, real-time video um, AI is is phenomenal. Uh, yeah. So you can see that happening, you know, for advertising, seeing customers' reactions. Um, it's, yeah. it's impressive. Or even counting audience. Um, if you have something like, let's say, a, a digital display somewhere, uh, being able to count, count <laughs> the audience. And yeah, for sure, AI and machine learning are great, but for sure they, they don't solve uh, all problems, right? No. But people will tell you it, 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 it does. You know, I think the problem with technology, um, and, you know, we saw this in the dot-com crash. I mean, we really believe this stuff. It's not that, yeah, there probably are some snake oil uh, salespeople uh, out there, but I think generally people think, you know, they've, they've found the next cure to cancer, you know, the, the anti-aging. They, they believe that, that this is, is going to change the world. Um, yeah. I tend to be very skeptical. It's, it's a kind of ironic. I'm, I'm actually pretty skeptical of technology. Uh, very, it's very rare for a technology to come maybe once every four or five years that really transforms um, society. Um, and most of it is just, is just, you know, silver shiny objects. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Kev, so let's turn the conversation over and like we are facing very uncertain moments but we all know that this biological crisis is delivering into a, a very important economical crisis. And you've been, you, I mean, you, 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 you live, like you've been through many downturns, right? The dot com, uh, the 9 11, 2008. What do you recommend to, like, to the audience for surviving? What do you recommend to survive? Well, Unfortunately, I've been through even more downturns. Uh, I fortunately <laughs> was not involved in the Spanish flu outbreak in 1918. So um, that, that would have been a useful one to, to uh, compare it to. Um, yeah. This is an unusual one and, and I, I'm, I'm really, really torn. I don't quite understand why the stock market is, is where it is. Um, when I talk to companies, uh, you know, everyone's very frozen. Um, I'm sure everyone knows in the advertising world. I, I wish I knew this in the dot-com crash that advertising is the canary uh, in the coal mine. Um, it is the first thing that that people can um, can pull. You know, it's easier to to um, pull money from someone else than it is to lay off people. So that's the first one to go. Um, ironically, there is a silver lining there. Uh, is that media prices go down quite a bit? So. 
in really good times, advertising prices, media prices are high and direct response doesn't work that well uh, in times. And you'll see it today. You see it on TV. People are watching a ton of, obviously a ton of TV um, and spending a lot of time on the internet. Direct response can work now. So um, if you have anything in the direct response side, uh, I would, I would, I would, I would go there. Um, I, I'm involved with a lot of companies right now, struggling, struggling through, you know, trying to figure out what to do. How bad will it get? Um, I always tell CEOs, and I always told people that people always say, "What does the CEO do?" Uh, <laughs> the CEO's main job is to never run out of money. Um, it's it's really that simple. Uh, you're in business to stay in business, and you got to figure out how to do it. Unfortunately, bad things tend to be worse than they than we forecast. Um, the big problem I saw with a lot of dot-com companies, just to give you an example of how bad dot-com was, 70% of DoubleClick's customers went out of business in a matter of, of four to five months. Um, so from a overall society standpoint, even though the stock market took a massive hit, and but the actual economy didn't take that much of a hit. Um, it was it was, but on the dot com from the dot com, it was it was beyond depression. It was it was extremely bad. Um, we had raised a lot of money, so we were very fortunate. But but we still we we went and we right sized our business, um, and we right sized it pretty aggressively. Um, and, and maybe in hindsight, we 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 made some mistakes. But I don't like to look in hindsight. So you know, you, you take the best information you have, um, and you and you make those decisions. Now back in those times, like I said, there were there were still companies. There were, a lot of companies were doing fine. Uh, so a lot of our folks went on to um, having a double click pedigree was was really good on the resume. They went on to start the advertising group at Facebook, uh, Google, um, you know, Amazon. They all they all went off and did great things and ended up, ended up doing fine. Um, it, now it's a little bit different though. It's it's very difficult. I think even more difficult. Um, we we face some issues just just being on boards. I'll, I'll share with you. You know, look as a as a being on a board, your fiduciary duty is to, to the shareholders and, and you have to right size your business and, and, you know, riffs layoffs are very difficult. Uh, but it's a, it's a natural part of the, you know, the free market system. Uh, it actually allocates, um, you know, uh, uh, resources to, to, to more productive places in the economy. So overall it's good. It's not great for an individual, but it's good, good overall. And, and usually people do fine in it. Um, the problem you find yourself in now is that there, there really are no, if someone gets laid off today, there, there isn't an opportunity for them. Um, now there may be some in six months or so. So you find yourself with these, you know, a bit of a, um, you know, the human moral issue, um, which is, you know, how do you, how do you right size the business? How do you keep it alive? but maybe not cut as deep as you normally would in, a, in an economy. Um, now, fortunately, there's been a lot of stimulus packages and, and, and um, um, unemployment packages that help people. Um, but, you know, that's a, that's a difficult challenge. But you got to right size your business you to stay in business. Um, the good news, I tell people, uh, two pieces of good news. You know, one is, is it, it does go, go away. Uh, but and you will come through it, but your weak competition goes away. This is a real thinning, uh, a thinning of the herd. Um, you know, the weakest folks, the ones that make the poor decisions, the ones that don't right size their business, uh, the ones that you, who just pretend it doesn't, the problem does, is just going to go away. Um, they're going to go away. Uh, and when you come out, you're going to be more <laughs> successful. The real point, turning point for Procore, uh, the construction software company, was was the last 2008 2009 uh, recession, which was very long, very painful, but it was actually the best thing that ever happened to the company. It's good to know also that you have been all uh, through all these crises and the fact of of telling to to a lot of people here that are hearing uh, that after the storm there is a sun again. Uh, it, it's good. And Kev, so probably a lot of people here are right sizing the business uh, into a very small one. Probably, as you said, uh, like double clicks folks that went, went into Facebook or Google or like to run these new advertising groups uh, or departments. So probably now there are a lot of uh, people thinking on, on starting a new business, right? Um, I mean, a lot of people uh, were laid off 
And I was thinking, uh, I'm very fortunate that I that I have you uh, as a mentor and advisor. But if if I wouldn't, uh, I will, I was thinking on what would I ask to Kevin O'Connor? Uh, apart, I know that you wrote a book that is uh, like how to build a, a company from nothing. So, I mean. I think that everyone will would like to to know and understand how do you, Kevin O'Connor, build a big company from nothing? Well, I, I'm I'm a I'm an engineer by background, um, and so I, I tend to I tend to approach things from um, I like things very logical and very simple. Uh, Dwight Merriman taught me something very interesting. It was always always. His whole thing was Occam's razor. I was like, after hearing it a hundred times, I'm like, what the hell is Occam's razor? And it's, you, it's the simplest solution is usually the best solution. So, so um, yeah, that became like a, an important part of the way I sort of view the world. But you know, building a business is is hard, uh, but the concepts are, are pretty simple. One is, uh, I love to ask MBA classes this this question, like, what's the purpose of a business? It's always like, it's profit and and this, and I'm like, you know, no, no, that the whole purpose of a business is to solve a, a big problem better than anyone else. Um, to me, that's like the formation of a, the foundation of any business. You've got to find a really big painful problem that people have, uh, and you've got to find the best, uh, most efficient solution. Now, that most efficient solution almost always involves technology. I'm biased towards that. I mean, it's not always the case, but but I think it, it, it's increasingly the case in today's world. So taking technology, solving to a, to a big problem, um, and you do it better than anyone else, you're gonna build a, you're gonna build a huge company. Um, and to me, you know, profits, things like profits uh, is a, uh, it's more of a scorecard. It's more of a, you're creating so much excess value, you've solved someone's problem um, so well uh, that they're willing to pay you, uh, you know, a big part of that value. Um, I think the biggest problem that people, and so in order to do this, it sounds easy, you know, it sounds, a, you know, solve a big problem, that's pretty hard. Um, I tend to approach, I, I, I sort of over the years developed this process, agencies would be very, very familiar with it. It's probably a, a it's a twist on brainstorming. Um, we actually codified it into a site called teamstormit.com, not yeah. so teamstormit.com. Uh, it's completely free. You know, you're more willing, your audience more willing to, to, to check it out. Uh, but I use this as sort of a way to to brainstorm. For example, what are the most what are the biggest most influential technologies, and narrow it down to two or three, and then apply that tech. You know, pick a particular industry. What are the biggest problems facing, let's say, the um, uh, the hospitality industry? Well, right now it's COVID, but let's say outside COVID, um, you know, what are the biggest problems? How do I apply, apply you know, big important tech to solve that problem? Um, and then using you know, like a team storm like process, building a business plan, you know, what are the not what are the, all the things that we can do in marketing? What are the two things we're gonna do in marketing? Not what are all the things we can do in sales? Uh, what are the two things? Not all of the features that we can add to the product, what are the five things? So it's it's this constant sort of we have a problem. What should our product look like? Here's all the possible solutions. What are the ones that we've already formed a consensus on that are the four or five things that we must do? Um, and I think the biggest mistakes that companies make is kind of the curse of the entrepreneur is they try to do all things. Either They're either so creative um, that the, the newest idea, sort of recency bias, the newest idea is the most interesting one, um, or they're afraid of missing missing out on that big idea. So they try to do all ideas. And if you've ever played the game of risk, you know, you, you end up losing real quick doing that. I mean, you just can't, you have finite resources, you can't dilute them. You gotta do the things you must do. Um, so probably the, 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 the third one is to focus on um, uh, people. And, and now I, I actually, we started graphic back in the 2008, 2009 period. Um, like you said, back when um, um, you get a lot of talent because no one could get jobs coming out of school. Um, my, my whole sort of MO, what I've discovered for hiring people uh, is to hire smart athletes 
uh, with great attitudes. Um, and let me just sort of decompose that. One is smart as you can't teach IQ. Uh, when, you're, when you're doing something new, um, there is no roadmap. You know, you, you've got to solve new problems. Uh, so you need people that are, that are smart. Uh, athlete, athlete really means people that have put themselves out in a competitive situation. You, you, you could be a chess champion. I don't, I don't particularly care. Uh, it's just someone who's, I, I don't like people that go to school and all they do is focus on great grades and they don't go out. They're not, they're not competitive uh, in any <laughs> aspect. Uh, so I really, really like that. And then the last one, it took me, it took me a long time to, to figure this one out, um, even though it's throwing me in the face, which is great attitude. Um, there are people that, that believe that there's sort of, you know, there, there's one thing like their, their whole journey in life is to, is to find that one thing, that one partner, that one job, that one, yeah, that is the perfect match for them in the cosmos. And then there's others that are just, you, you got to love the one you're with, uh, quoting Dave Crosby, Stills and Ash. Um, you got to, you know, I, don't, I was a dishwasher, you know, I did the best job I could. You know, I just, you, you just, you got to have like a great attitude in whatever you're doing. I, I learned that actually that we, we had a person at Graphic, um, and Graphic was in Santa Barbara. If you've never been to Santa Barbara, it's probably one of the most spectacular places on the planet. Uh, it's like perfect weather, mountains, we, ocean. It's we, great. Played, we played basketball with, with the Graphic team. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And, but one of, the, one of the people had quit and he said, Santa Barbara is like the most horrible place in the world. I was like, what? <laughs> and I knew he had a bad attitude and I didn't want to hire him before that. I was like, ah, that's it. And I went back and I sort of remembered all those times where I heard people with, you know, they were just never happy. You know, I'm from Detroit. I love Detroit. I had a great time there. Um, no problem. And then probably the, the, the final one is, is and it's going to be hard to do, is raising the right amount of capital. It doesn't take that much to start a business. Um, you know, most businesses today, you can create a product, is so it's very cheap, $25,000, $50,000. Uh, but once you do uh, have something, raising the right amount of money, when I say right amount of money, you don't want to do, it's the, the, the three bears. You, know, you don't want to raise too little money, um, and you don't want to raise too much money. People, you, you look at things like... Um, uh, what's the scooter, the scooter companies, they all raise, you know, billions of dollars or, or we work or, um, uh, the, the other company, I can't remember oil, oil, um, you know, they raise massive, massive amounts of money. And uh, it just gives people the, you end up replicating your mistakes all over the world. Um, it's better to raise the right amount of money as you go through each stage, prove it out. You know, the reality is that most ideas are terrible. Uh, most companies aren't going aren't to be able to, to find a fit. Number one reason companies fail, they can, their product doesn't actually solve a need. Um, and, you know, then, you know, can you, can you scale the company? And um, so raising the right amount of money to kind of get through that whole process. Um, uh, and if, the question here is, uh, then do you have any, any clue or any guidance to say, like, what's the right amount of money? I mean, of course, I'm not talking about number, right? What, but what's the calculation that you will you'll need to do in order to say, okay, this is at core we we and at 500 startups uh, and with all the with you and all the investors that uh, are advisors for us and and are the board. So we always think on on 18 months to accomplish the goals from 18 months from now, right? So you have. 12 months to execute the business and then you have six months of buffer to raise the next round right but always thinking on on a goal what's the amount of money that you need to accomplish that goal uh, is this the way you you will think on that i don't necessarily think of time but that's not that's not a bad I mean, it's, it's always good to have a goal with a, a time constraint uh, but let's say you want to um uh, you, you know, there's different stages in, 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 in venture. Um, you know, there's C, there's Series A, Series B. Both those have certain, both those, let's say in SaaS companies, you're, you're certain revenue levels that you need to demonstrate. So those typically are the goals. It may take you 18 months to get there. I always tell people raise, you know, 150% of what they think it's going to be because it usually takes longer um, and, and uh, uh, it takes longer to achieve the goal. Now, 
Sometimes it doesn't, it's great. You, you have too much money now, uh, that's fine. Uh, but usually it's the other way around. People, uh, entrepreneurs overestimate their abilities. I overestimate my ability, we, I, we all do. Yeah. And Kev, here uh, in, in YouTube, we have a, a lot of people asking questions. So I will, I will mention three. You can pick the, the one you, you like to answer first. And so here's what are the best things you can do to work on culture to grow faster? Then uh, do you think that the new digital habits that we're using on, on remote work are like will impact on, on business at, at, at businesses scaling? We, we can go through each. Why don't we go through each, each one of those? Okay, let's start with, I'm curious, one person that is asking about, what's the name of the website you mentioned? It's uh, Team Storms IT, right? Team Storm IT. Yeah. T-E-A-M-S-T-O-R-M-I-T.com. Great. So let's go with the first one. So what are the best things you can do to work on culture to grow faster? You know, culture is always been, I, I, I'm, I'm torn about the whole culture thing. To me, to me culture is, is uh, I've got two parts of it. Everyone thinks it's, it's really, really important. And, and I think, look, if you, if you hire smart athletes and you're solving a real problem, um, you're going to have, you're going to have a great culture. Um, and, you know, you can codify certain things, but, you know, pithy little statements up on the, up on the wall don't, don't really don't really do anything. Um, to me, you know, the cultures I always tried to create, uh, and by the way, it didn't work for everyone. Some people hate it, hate it, um, uh, working, uh, working with me. Um, <laughs> it's, it, it was really, it was to solve big problems. Uh, it was to be inventive. Uh, it was merit, meritocracy, a hundred percent meritocracy. Um, I think companies moved away from that. I think it, it sends a lot of sort of very mixed signals within the company. Um, I've always told people, like I was always a very reluctant CEO. If I wasn't the best CEO, then then great. You know, it's great. someone's better than me, great. You know, I'd, I'd be thrilled. Um, now, with that said, I never found the magic formula. When Amazon bought Graphic, um, you know, I had the I had the earn out. You know, I figured I was going to be, you know, I'll do, do it for a year, um, you know, with the, what do they call it? Best and rest or whatever. Um, that's not my personality. So I, I was, I was pretty, I was very, very engaged. Uh, and Amazon, you know, a, a company that it's the world's largest company. How do they get there? Um, I think we tend to always, you know, uh, oh, big companies can't have cultures. No, Amazon does. I tell companies, you want a culture? Go to Amazon, Amazon leadership principles and take the ones that you like. Those, the proof, those are very proven. They're great. Um, and what Amazon does that I found really, really interesting is those culture principles existed at every level. So you interviewed people to hire based on those cultures. You promoted people based on those cultures. You, um, uh, uh, they had a concept. I wasn't a huge fan of it, which was you write papers, you write a press announcement, you write, you write a, a brief on something, um, but it had to relate to those, to those cultures. So I thought they did the best job I've ever seen of bringing those, those um, uh, uh, cultures of key part of the, uh, uh, part of the company. When they bought, um, when they bought graphic, it was, I guess legally a merger, which is always kind of kind of funny. Um, you know, they were they were pretty nervous. The New York Times had done an article on Amazon how people you know hated the culture. You know, it was, it was really driven and hard work and and you know frugal and things like that. And uh, of course, everyone in our company had read it and they were very nervous about it. Like, how do you guys feel about this? And we're like, what a bunch of whiners! You know, the people that were complaining to the New York Times. I mean, we we were like our culture was a perfect fit for them. You know, we work, work very hard. Um, our biggest debate we used to have within the company, we have a survey about life, life work balance. And it created like this interesting debate within the company because what's 
the balance. I mean, what, it's, it's one of the same. I mean, for, for a lot of us, our life is our work. We don't really, you know, inventing things, solving people's problems. I'm obsessed right now with COVID. I think COVID in my mind <laughs> is one of the most, you know, look, it's a horrible disease. And I hope, I hope, you know, I, I feel terrible for people that have lost, lost lives or, or family members, but from a, from a solving this problem standpoint, I'm, I'm extremely fascinated. Uh, from an economic standpoint, from a number standpoint, I've been modeling. Um, I, I've, I've been, I've, I was, I was in touch with the IHME researchers uh, who, who had been modeling these horrific de deaths. And I was like, you're wrong. This is completely like, you didn't do back testing on your model. It's wrong. It's not going to be nearly as bad as you're projecting. It's, it's terrible. So, um, sorry, I got a little, I got a little off, off. There, no, 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 but it, but it's fine. And there's a question here that is very similar to to the one we have been through. Is uh, how do you get so big and still stay in control of what is happening within the company? Well, it, 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 control is the wrong word. I mean, I, I don't think that's. I'm a I'm a very much look. I I'm a I'm a libertarian in the sense I love free market. I I, I think and I think there's a free market within the within a company. I think one of the biggest mistakes that people make is they try to bend um, um, humans' natural instincts to fit the uh, to align with what the corporation is trying to achieve. And I, I don't I don't try to do that. I try to sit there and say, look, this is the way people are going to act. How do we how do we align their interests with the company's interests as opposed to to, to bending them? Um, and you know, if you hire really good, smart people, and you delegate, and you trust them, um, you know, it works out great. You know, there's nothing to control. Um, now, look, you got to have financial. You know, to me, I I always like to have business units where people are very focused. They wake up every day and worry about a particular customer, and then you have to have control. You know, to have HR, you have to have finance that goes kind of across a large organization. To, to me, those are sort of your control functions. Make sure that people aren't breaking the law; they're not stealing money. Um, you know, you you put you put you put, put the control that way. Otherwise, I I would you know you break into business units and say, look, you go compete for the dollars. You make the decisions. Um, one of the best cultural things that came out of um, we heard a lot of people in Bain uh, Consulting, but they had a they had a thing saying, presume positive intent. So. I think that's always a good thing to, to remember is that, you know, people spend a lot of time on something and they're, and you've hired really smart people. You're going to trust that they've done their homework and they've, and they've, and they've done it. Now I like to do trust and verify. Uh, I tended to dig and Amazon was a big believer in this. You dig deep into um, um, your leaders have to be able to dig very deep into problems um, because you do run into crises within a, within a company. So you trust people, but you also ask really, really tough questions. Like when people showed up to a meeting, they knew they were going to get asked really hard questions and they better be prepared for it. Nice, nice. And here's Eric asking, what do you think will be the most disruptive change to the digital advertising space in the next five years? It's a complex one, right? <laughs> I mean, I talked about some of that. That's such a hard, yeah. Uh, hard to tell. Hard. Yeah. I mean, I, <laughs> I mean, really, think, I, I do think it's it's the taking this taking this massive amount of data across all mediums um, and being able to tailor it. The customer journey very unique. What 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 are they what type of creative they respond to? What type of offers? When they get to your website, the website is completely tailored tailor for them based on based on where they are in their process and what their interests are. So it's it's um it's it's gonna be, you know, it's it's gonna be like self-driving cars. Um, it's gonna be very hands-off. Um, and not many people really know what's going on, but it there'll be models that keep getting optimized and, and improving the um, uh, the experience for everybody. Yeah. And Kev, do you think any of the habits that we are taking today in these remote work days are gonna help on scaling businesses? Yes. Yeah, so we talked a little bit about about the gig 
the professional gig economy, I think is going to grow. Um, hmm. I, look, I, I believe a lot of stuff happens within companies and around the proverbial water cooler, um, having ad hoc meetings with people, uh, you know, can this be done remotely? You know, there's a lot of things that can be done remotely much better than they can be done in person. I'm, I'm still a little torn on exactly what that is. Um, I mean, I love working remotely. This is so much more efficient. You know, I can, my commute is, is 30 seconds, um, <laughs> you know, both directions. Um, I don't have to travel for meetings anymore, which was, you know, a, a, a colossal waste of time. So I don't think it bodes well for um, uh, business travel uh, anymore. Um, I think, I, I do think that there is a, you know, one of the reasons I invested in, in core is that, you know, there, there is a, I mean, look, to try to do a tech company in, in Silicon Valley is, it's almost impossible. The, the talent is so expensive. I've always done companies outside Silicon Valley um, uh, for various reasons, but, you know, there's smart people all over this planet. They're, they're not, you know, not every smart tech person is in Silicon Valley. This is, that's a fallacy. Um, and in fact, uh, you know, there's a lot of great tech people, you know, probably the biggest thing that, that I, uh, one of the bigger topics we talk about it within companies is how do we offshore uh, development? And before, you know, look, 20 years ago, offshore talent was, it wasn't the same. Um, today, it's, there's some extraordinary talent, whether it's in Buenos Aires or the Ukraine or Colombia. Um, there are some very, very talented people. And I think, so I think, I think from a remote standpoint, especially where you have pockets where there's, um, I'm not sure we're going to have this pocket um, over the next six <laughs> months, but, you know, where there's, where there's a big supply demand, demand and balance of, of talent. Um, we'll have all, all appreciate you can do it remotely, but not everyone can work remotely. You know, I, I don't, you know, some people just aren't as, as disciplined. You got to be very disciplined to work remotely. Yeah, hundred percent agree. On, and we'll pick the last one. Um, Kevin, what was the most difficult aspect you faced leaving your business when growing at a size you didn't imagine you started when you started? Can you can you repeat that? So it will say I'm gonna rephrase it. It means. Um, Did you face any big challenge while growing the company? Like, can you tell us the, the biggest challenge you faced? I'm sure that you can count <laughs> at least 10, right? No, you, you know, I, I swear to God this happened um, <laughs> at double click. I remember sitting in, in um, uh, an office with Kevin Ryan, and this was probably 2000, and double click had grown from two people in my basement to 2,500 people in 24 countries in like four years. And yeah, sure. There was lots of challenges. There's plenty of challenges, but, but I, I said to Kevin, I said, Kevin, something's wrong here. Uh, this has been too easy. It's been too easy to get talent. You know, it's only 40% of, of Stanford and Harvard MBAs were deferring. We're, we're dropping out of school to join internet companies. And we we had the pick of pick of the litter. Um, Raising money, it was a joke. I mean, you could go out. We went out. We raised, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. You know, with 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 so easy. And I looked at him. I said, "Look, man, the shit's gonna hit the fan. This is it, it's it, it, doing a startup is is way harder than than what we've experienced." And that was right before the whole privacy thing hit us, uh, and then the dot com, and then the nine eleven, and and everything else. Um, so. <laughs> Those are, you know, those are by far the biggest challenges is, 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 is during a crisis. Um, you know, scaling, you know, growing is easy. I shouldn't say it's easy. I mean, there, there's lots of, it, I'm really into sort of organizational philosophy and, and aligning people. If you align people and you hire, like a double click, we hired people, not people that could manage 10 people, but people that could manage, you know, 100 people or 1,000 people. You know, we, we took one person, I remember Dave Rosenblatt, um, Dave Rosenblatt had managed two people in his life and we needed someone to run our dark division, which was about 500 people. And I was like, Dave Rosenblatt, he doesn't fail. And I was like, what? You know, he's like, he managed two people. He can't manage 500. 
I'm like, look, man, he's, I, I call him, I call him the Michael Jordan. And you got to have Michael Jordan. And for those of you guys who don't know, you should all know Michael Jordan, but who are you going to give the ball to with, with, with a, a second and a half left on the clock? You give it to Jordan. Um, you know, who, who are those people in your organizations that you can give the, you can give the ball to them. They may not win every game. Not every game is winnable, but they're going to give you your best shot. And so knowing those, finding those Michael Jordans and promoting them as quickly as you can throughout the organization is, is key. Um, the biggest challenges is when you hit a, when you hit a crisis uh, because you have a crisis of, of, of confidence. And as a CEO, you know, one of the things that's, that leadership, one trait that is inversely correlated to leadership is called neuroticism. Um, and neuroticism got a lot of bad, bad, but it's a technical term for a uh, psychological trait, but neuroticism is basically how you react to things. Do you get angry? Do you freak out? Do you get emotional? You know, whatever, whatever it is. Um, and, and people don't like leaders that get emotional. People like leaders that solve problems and remain cool. So in this crisis, uh, you, you gotta, you know, you got, this is life, man. This is, this is, life is not all happy. Life is, life is about sometimes going out of business. Sometimes it's about dying. Sometimes it's about, it's about a lot of bad things. The challenge is how do you navigate through this? Uh, and people do it. Are you going to be one of those people that, that navigate successfully through it and have a great attitude and bring others along? Or are you going to, you know, are you going to let the, let the circumstance control you. Oh. Kev, and just, we have three more minutes and a question, a new question came in. So uh, I, I started, uh, I'm still with, the, with those two concepts, solving problems and staying cool. I love them. Um, Kev, with so many solutions that are solved service, uh, and software as a service. Uh, how do you see the future for digital ad agencies? Do you or, think? Yeah, I mean. Oh, I, you, you, I, you have to, you have you have to, and, and I've I've seen this by the way for twenty five years, and and you see agencies that you, you have to embrace technology. You have to figure out figure out what you do well what is unique and what can technology do better? And if you don't do it, you know, in a free market system, um, you, you, you put yourself at a competitive disadvantage and you're gonna hurt a lot of people. You're gonna get a lot of resistance uh, with an organization. Um, I'll give you an example is that when, when DoubleClick, our biggest competition was people who had publishers that built their own in-house, uh, well, well, biggest competition was people who uh, we were one of the first SaaS companies. We didn't call it SaaS. We didn't know what it was, but there was <laughs> software that you brought in house. And so people, CIOs uh, wanted to control their own software. They didn't want to outsource it. They didn't want to let others do it. So, uh, and, and um, we, Bain, Bain actually did a study for us. They said, never pitch the CIO, pitch the, the, pitch the CEO and the CFO and the VP of ad sales. They don't like the CIO because he never delivers on, on the promise. Now I'm using this as an analogy, uh, but the reality is that you're going to have that within any organization and every resistance. You've got to be able to use the best, most effective um, solutions. A lot of those times are, those are technologies. You're going to get resistance. Uh, people are going to say, we can build this in house or this is too newfangled. It's not going to, it's not going to work. And sometimes it doesn't work by the way, but you got to look at companies that have had success with it. And you're either going to put yourself at a competitive disadvantage or you're going to put yourself at a competitive advantage. Yeah, totally agree. Great. So Kev, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Um, you gave great advice, great guidance. Uh, thanks a lot for, for your time. And we hope everyone enjoyed this as, as I did. <laughs> I had a good time. Thank you, Santi. Thank you. And thanks always for, for trusting in us. So it's a ciao. Ciao. Later. <laughs> Bye, Kev. Thank you. Later. Bye.